So on to today's webinar, Returning to Work Safely, an introduction to the government's new COVID-19 health and safety regulations. Now that the government has begun to outline its plan to enable certain sectors in England to return to work, it's essential for businesses to understand how to do this safely and how to safeguard the health and well-being of their people. Although those who can work from home are still advised to continue to do so, official guidance for returning to the workplace and how to keep it safe has now been published by the government, which includes eight guides covering a range of different sectors of work. Under the current climate, many people will be anxious and concerned Sorry, there's another one joining. Um, to return to work as an employer. It is extremely important to ensure that staff have the confidence to return. Whether you work in retail, manufacturing, service led or hospitality, returning to work will require effective planning and consideration. Therefore, I am delighted that we have joined forces again with Bayani HR and Employment Law um, to bring you this webinar. And I'm joined by our experts this morning, Jay Bayani and Jason Thelwell. Um, who I'll shortly be handing over to, to kick things off. Uh, Jay is just going to give some general thoughts on returning to work, workforce planning, flexible furlough, and what to do if things like em uh, employees refuse to return. Uh, and then she'll hand over to Jason to go through some of the safety aspects. And then we will open to questions. So a reminder that it is an open forum. You can post questions in the chat box, or alternatively, given that it's quite a small group, you can raise your hand. Uh, and I can come to you and you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly to the speakers. Um, I think that's that's it for now then. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to our first speaker this morning, Jay Barney. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Sam. Morning, morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you hear me? Okay, um, yeah, nice to see some familiar faces. Um, I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, some of you know me already and have been to some of our previous um, webinars, both with the Chamber and the ones that we run as a firm. <clears throat> uh, those of you that don't know me, um, I, I uh, am an employment law solicitor and um, my team specialises in everything to do with employment law, HR and health and safety. So you can imagine that the last few weeks have been pretty busy for us um, and we've been at the forefront of providing lots of <clears throat> advice and interpreting some of the government guidance so you know it's not always easy keeping on top of it all and we don't know all the answers but uh, today we're going to do our best to uh, tell you a bit about returning to work safely so I think it was the 11th of May when Boris Johnson made his announcement um, that employees that can't work from home should return to work and that wasn't um, could or it might be possible or you should start thinking about that it was should return to work um, and therefore you know since then the uh, lockdown measures have been eased slightly and there's a plan to get lots of businesses back up and running that have been closed um, so from the 15th of june we should see a lot more activity and then from the beginning of july uh, with sectors like the hospitality industry there's a you know there's a lot of work going on there to try and uh, get them working in a way that uh, that protects people um, as, as far as possible but also enables the economy to to really get moving so um, on the question of returning to work before we look at the safety aspects of creating uh, a workplace that's that's safe uh, i just thought i'd share with you a couple of the questions that we've already had so first of all there's um, the question over flexible furlough so you'll know that the furlough scheme is still available to use until the end of october um, but it's going to be used in an altered form from the 1st of July for businesses that want to have employees return to work, but, um, but want to take advantage of um, part-time working, which makes complete sense. And I was delighted to see that they brought that forward to the 1st of July when originally it was planned to be from August. So, you know, if you've got any questions around that or anything else as we're speaking, do, as Sam said, do put a question on the chat or we can talk about it later. So I'm not going to cover um, the flexible furlough uh, rules, but those of you that aren't on our mailing list, if you want to um, subscribe to our newsletter, then we, we are very regularly updating everything that comes, comes out that's new. So it might be useful for you. 
Um, okay, so what if an employee doesn't want to return to work? That's the biggest question we've had so far. So we've had, um, lot, we work with lots and lots of clients of all sorts of sizes and sectors. And I think that's been one of the first questions after Boris Johnson's um, announcement. Uh, what do we do if somebody says they don't want to return to the workplace, whether it's an office or some other environment? But first of all, um, in law, there is uh, something called the Employment Rights Act, which governs most of our employment legislation. And Section 44 and Section one, uh, 100 of the Employment Rights Act protects uh, employees who refuse to work uh, because they feel that they're in serious and imminent danger. So that's not something just come into play with uh, coronavirus, that's always been uh, the law. And so we've had a look at how that might apply here. So well, clearly you're going to have some employees who don't want to return because they um, are scared that the environment isn't safe for them or the impact on their families when they're going home. So really the rule around that is that their belief that they are coming into an unsafe working environment has to be um, both genuine and reasonable. So your starting point is to make sure that those that can work from home, you still do have um, an obligation under the government guidance to enable home working. And uh, on home working, the Prime Minister's, one of his uh, manifesto pledges apparently was to introduce home working. That was before the coronavirus. So uh, I think it'll be, it won't be any surprise to me if they introduce as part of their package um, of getting back to work um, a, a right to request to work from home. So I think, you know, those of you that have already been using facilities to work from home need to really gear, gear them up for a bit of a longer term, um, if not indefinitely, for some employees. So if they refuse, first of all, as I say, you've got to show why you can't um, enable them to work from home. If you need them in your workplace, then you've got to justify why that is. Um, the best thing to do is to communicate with employees. If you follow the guidance that Jason's going to take you through and you demonstrate that you're doing everything you can to provide a safe um, environment to work, then you as an employer are fulfilling your duties. Um, and then I suppose the last resort is that if the employee still refuses to attend to the workplace and they haven't got a valid reason and you know it's just a, a, an irrational fear, then you can look at either extending the furlough scheme if you want to, you can look at unpaid leave, or as a last resort, you can look at dismissal. Um, and we've already been advising some of our clients, sadly, about uh, potential dismissal for employees who have no logic um, to, to, to their refusal, but have got used to being at home and frankly just can't, can't be bothered to come into the workplace, saving them lots of money in traveling uh, and, and other costs. Okay, so that's that's uh, the big one. And then um, I don't know how much Jason's going to talk about mental health, but just to say that bear in mind um, that mental health of employees that are on furlough or are returning to work is a big issue. Um, you need to think about whether you've got a mental health policy, um, wh whether you're equipping your employees with tools. I know the Chambers run a few sessions on well-being. Um, and some of our local businesses like Champion Health and Westfield provide some really good free tools. Um, which you can pass on to your employees uh, and from a business point of view keep a paper trail that you're doing that so that you can demonstrate that you're doing what you can to um, assist your employees at, at a difficult time and just bear in mind that if you then if you ask employees to return to work after a period of furlough um, you need to support them in that and think about whether that should be on a phased basis um, you, you need to be checking in to make sure that that's not causing undue concern because, you know, I, I think the nation's been completely divided um, and with my own friends, I found it so shocking, you know, that some people have an attitude that we should all get back to work. I'm afraid I'm a little bit in that camp. And then I've got friends who I would never have thought would be so scared of, you know, leaving the house uh, right now because uh, people react differently to things. I think you know we've uh, we've got to look out for that with our employees. Okay, so the best thing to do to get people back to work and not have any issues with people refusing to to attend the workplace is to make sure that you're demonstrating that you've got a safe system of work um, and, a, and a safe workplace. So the government has introduced um, guidance which is quite comprehensive 
um, but you can also get support from people like us. So we, we also deliver health and safety for clients, um, but there's a lot that you can do yourselves to work through the guidance and it's split into different sectors. Have a look at the sector that's appropriate for you. Um, but I think that's, that's all I want to say. So I'll pass on to Jason, who will now go through, he deals with much more of the health and safety within the firm, but he'll go through uh, some of the practical measures that you need to put in place and, uh, and the five steps. Okay, Jason. Um, yeah, thanks, Jay. Morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, it, it's health and safety is is probably the forefront of everybody's minds at the moment in terms of you know returning back to work and, and making sure that you know we have a safe environment in which to, to welcome the employees back. Um, I'm going to take you through um, a few slides um, uh, just to to perhaps sort of give you some uh, hopeful, useful information and tips on, on sharing the you know, the government sort of stance on this and how you can incorporate this into your, into your working practices. Um, so just bear with me while I, I'll share this screen with you. And uh, hopefully you can, uh, you'll all be able to see this. Um, so yeah, so I think the, the first thing to, to sort of say really about health and safety is um, that there's always been a rule um, around number of of people in your organization and that will determine what you need to do so if you have less than five staff um, then essentially you don't really need to have anything written down and documented now i, I genuinely think if you know due to covid19 and because of what happened then i think that rule should be overwritten so you know the rules are there for, for everybody, whether you employ one member of staff or whether you have 500, the rules and regulations are still the same. So um, I think the first thing I'd, I'd perhaps sort of point out is if you do have less than five staff in your organisation, what I'm about to show you, I think you need to implement as well. Um, uh, you know, wh whether it's one staff or, or, or two or three, then, then I think you just do need to document it down. And, and, and probably the main reason that, that Jay's already touched upon there as well is, is the fact that, you know, should you need that documentary evidence to say that these things have been done, if staff are refusing to come back to, work, to the workplace, um, and at least you can, you can demonstrate that you've, you've got that documentary evidence. So, uh, so I think, you know, for, for me, it's not a government guideline, but I think my ruling would be less than five staff start to document things down and i think that's so so important to do um so all businesses that, that are set to reopen are going to have to demonstrate now that they are covid secure and the important thing about this is that that, that that you should have these things in place prior to reopening now some of you may have already reopened your business which is absolutely great um if you haven't got what i'm about to sort of take you through in, in place um don't worry too much um, you know, we should have had it in place before reopening, but, but if you haven't, then, you know, I'd suggest you, you, you perhaps sort of spend the next sort of few days, week, in, in terms of implementing uh, what we're about to go through. But, but, you know, legally and technically, then we should, we should be able to demonstrate that we are COVID secure before we even bring staff back into the, into the premises. Um, this is a five-step guide poster. This is a government poster. Um, that you can quite easily download from from HSC website or the government website. Um, staying COVID nineteen secure in twenty twenty. Um, this is just as important to have on display as your health and safety at work poster. The health and safety at work poster is a, a, a it's regulated. It's, it's it, it, you have to have it on display. Um, staying COVID nineteen secure is just as important now. Um, the free to download. Um, HSC website, government website, go on there, um, go on to the, the uh, coronavirus section, you can quite easily down, download it uh, from, from that. Um, and, and five steps uh, to safer working together is really what we're going to kind of run through this morning. So the first step is, is, is we've touched upon there, the COVID-19 risk assessment. And importantly, to share those results with, with, with your staff as well. So, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of busy doing the risk assessments for COVID-19, um, but certainly ones that I've spoken to have, have then done it, put it in their health and safety file and stuck it on their, their shelf in their office, uh, which collates dust, but not sharing that information. So it's so vitally important to make sure that you do share that information with, with, uh, with your staff. Um, and I will just give you a, a brief sort of guide on, on how to 
put that risk assessment together. Um, second stage then is, is, is common sense, the cleaning, the hand washing, the hygiene in line with the guidance. Um, taking steps that Jay's already talked about there about working from home, so we'll talk about that. Uh, maintaining that two metre uh, distance, social distancing in the workplace and how to manage transmission risk if you can't really be two metres apart. So staying COVID-19 secure, that's the poster. That's what you need to have on display in your office, in your workplace, um, not just for your staff, but also to demonstrate to visitors, customers, clients that are coming into your workplace as well, that, that you are COVID-19 secure. So the first of those five steps then is, is to carry out that, that risk assessment. And as we mentioned there, it should ideally be done before you allow employees back into the, into the workplace. Um, HSE website is a very, very good informative website. So as Jay said, um, you know, by all means, you know, take this information, run with it, you know, put it into place yourself. HSE website is a great tool to, to, um, to get a lot of information from. There are risk assessment templates on there as well for you to, to, to use. Um, what I wouldn't do when you're carrying out a risk assessment is just download, sample a copy of a risk assessment and think that will do. Um, you really need to start from scratch, from a blank piece of paper and create your own risk assessment um, because, you know, some businesses are going to have different sort of risks and levels of risks than others. So, you know, you've got to make sure that it's pertinent to, to your own business. And as we mentioned, you've got to share those results with, with all, all your staff. Um, I think one of the good things about carrying out a risk assessment, whether it's for COVID-19 or a general risk assessment, you get some of the staff to actually do some of the jobs for you, so delegate out. And I'll just give you get a prime example of, of this. So this is a, a typical uh, a part of a risk assessment. This is not a full risk assessment by any stretch of the imagination. It's just one part of, of, of um, a risk assessment itself. So um, you don't have to have it in, in tables and columns like this. Um, I find it's much easier to, to, to work with when you have it set up like this. Um, and so you start off with looking at what, what are the, the actual hazards, who might be then harmed, what you're going to do to try and suppress that, any additional controls that you need to put in place. And then the last three columns there is, is self-explanatory. So action by who? So it doesn't have to land on your shoulders. So, you know, if you've got a competent member of staff that perhaps knows a little bit about health and safety, then you might want to delegate to them. So who, who's going to do it? When are you going to do it? By and then and then when it's been done so so i've just put in there you know as, as a starter for 10 really this you know what's the hazard well it's on everybody's minds at the moment that you know the spread of covid19 and and certainly talking about that second spike the second wave um you know we want to try and suppress that so who might be armed well actually everybody really in, in terms of the spread of, of the, the the virus so you start visitors cleaners contractors uh, you know, vulnerable groups as well, so pregnant workers, elderly people, um, but really anybody that comes into your workplace could could well be harmed by the spread of, of, of the coronavirus. Controls required, so this is not an exhaustive list, this is just one example, so hand washing, um, so really you've got to try and be as in-depth as, as you possibly can, so it's no good really just put in controls required hand washing, then you kind of need to list what you're going to do around that hand washing. So, you know, the sanitizers, the paper towels, the drying of hands. Um, you, so in some workplaces, you may go as far as encouraging your staff to protect the skin and things like that. It depends on, again, the level of sort of risk that you've got in your, in your workplace. Um, and again, if you look at the additional controls, uh, employees got to be reminded on a regular basis to wash their hands for 20 seconds with water and so Again, I know this is all kind of sort of common sense, but the one thing about health and safety that, that is so, so important, you've always got to remember, is that if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. And so even though you might look at that and think, well, this is just common sense, it is common sense, but you know, if it's not written down, it's not there. So this is why it's so important to make sure you, you, you try and put as much information in there as, as you can. So like I said, hand washing doesn't have to be yourself that's responsible for it, delegate it to somebody else. But at least then, you know, once they've done it, you know, you know who's done it, when they've done it, uh, and, and what date. And that's so important to make sure those last three columns are filled in. Um, because if you ever do get a visit from, from health and safety executive, they're going to want to see that, that you have these controls in place and that you are COVID-19 secure. So 
that's a, a, a typical page, and, and, and I stress it is just a page, that's not a full risk assessment, that's just you know one, one page, one section of a risk assessment. But I thought it might be useful you know, if you've not seen one before, or if you've not done one before, that, that it might be useful to, to, for you to, to have a look at how they're set out and the kind of information that, that you need to, to put into that. Um, the second part of the five-step plan then is, is the cleaning, the hand washing, and the hygiene procedures. Um, I'm not going to run through that all. You can, you can see there. And again, a lot of it is common sense, but um, but these are the kind of things that health and safety executive are, are very, very keen on, and the government for that matter as well, to make sure that you know we are putting these sort of steps in place, um, uh, you know, to try and keep it as secure as we possibly can. Um, I think I think one thing that that's kind of sort of cropped up with the sort of cleaning and watching is some people that I've spoken to have said, well, we're okay with that because we have a, an office cleaner or a workplace cleaner. Don't rely upon the cleaner to make sure that everything's done. Yes, they're going to make sure that your workplace is clean as much as they possibly can. But, you know, it's good practice for staff to come in first thing on the morning. You know, if they've got sort of wipes, uh, uh, dry wipes, they can wipe their, their workstation area, their desk, um, door handles, things like this. These are probably things that perhaps cleaners might not necessarily do. But these are the things that you've got to start to think about to, to make sure you're, you're as secure as you possibly can. Um, the third bit is, is, is working from home. Um, now, you know, you can't, and I'm not suggesting for one minute, that everybody's working from home. You actually go out to their homes and make sure that you know uh, you assess their risk um, but perhaps what might be a good idea is to give them a, a template of a risk assessment a working from home risk assessment and let them fill that in themselves and, and pass it back through to you so again you know you're making sure that they have um you know a, a sensible workstation area um they have the facilities that they need in terms of uh, you know um, equipment um, Wi-Fi, um, again, sanitization and things like that. You know, you can't be responsible for that yourself with them being at home, but at least you've taken all reasonable steps and 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 be as reasonable practical as you can um, to make sure that they are carrying out these sort of things. Um, I think it's important to to incorporate and include people working from home. Jay mentioned uh, their, you know, the, the, the mental well-being. Um, it's very difficult, I think, if 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 you're not used to working from home. And you may have found this yourself. If, if you're used to being in that office environment, then you suddenly find yourself, and pardon the pun, in isolation, essentially is, is what you are. It's a very strange sort of scenario for people that are used to working with other people around them. Um, prior to, 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 to coming to Bayani Law, um, I spent 10 years working from home. And so I'm quite used to it. And it is a lonely thing. Um, when I joined Barney Law, I was really excited to, to be part of an office team again. And then after three months, I got kicked out and, and I'm back working from home for the time being. But, you know, we're taking steps to, to get back into the office environment. But so for me, it's quite easy to work from home because I'm used to it. But you've got to think about people that aren't necessarily in that mindset. And it is quite a difficult thing to do. So help them with the structure in their day, help them with a tint that helps um, hit them. And advice and hints on on how, how to structure their day from 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 working from home, um, uh, but again, you're very important to make sure that you know their, their mental health is is being looked after. And Jay mentioned there a couple of local businesses in in Sheffield, Harry Bliss over at Champion Health, great person to talk to. Um, if you've not had the opportunity to speak to Harry, I suggest to pick up the phone and speak to him because. Uh, you know, he, he, he's got a wealth of knowledge in terms of, of um, employee well-being. Um, so Harry Bliss at, at Champion Health is a great person to, to talk to on that. Um, the fourth one is, is the maintaining the, the two metre social distancing. Um, I ain't going to spend a great deal of time on that because we, 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 we hear that in our sleep these days. But it is so, so important to make sure that, you know, you do have that two metre distance between people. So you know, the sharing of desks and things like that is, is certainly not, not done anymore. Um, putting up signs to remind workers and, and visitors of that two metre ruling. You know, we, we, we go into, you know, um, shop, supermarkets. I went to a supermarket yesterday and the signs are there, aren't they? You know, two metres apart. Um, using floor tape. Yeah, again, I mean, that is something that you can do. We see it in supermarkets again and warehouses. Would you really want floor tape in your office? Probably not. 
Um, but you know, again, it's it's adapting it to your own workplace and what's better for you. Um, and the final one on there as well is switching to seeing visitors by appointment only, if, if possible. You know, uh, make sure perhaps wherever you can that you're expecting people to 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 come in rather than just people walking in off the street. Difficult if you're in retail, because obviously if you shop, people are going to be walking in all the time. But again, if you're a, an office-based sort of business, then you know, prior appointment uh, consultations is, is probably a good thing to introduce if you're not already doing that. Um, and then the fifth part of that is is the managing of the transmission risk. So if if you can't really stay that two meters apart, then you have to look at ways of of how you're going to get around that. So um, you know, using back to back or, or, or side to side desks, staggering arrivals. What we've done at Bayani Law is is we we kind of gone back into the office on a on a rotor basis so you can reduce the number of people that are in your workplace and, and perhaps do that in teams as well. So you know if you have I don't know 10 staff then you may have five the same five in one day and the same five in the next. So again you're keeping it to, to certain teams rather than mixing and matching. Um, staggering arrivals and departures again can't always do that if it's a, a you know a, a, a nine to five business or, or set working time business but these are all things that, that you might want to consider um, if you're going to struggle to have that, that, that two meter two meter social distancing so those are the sort of five five sort of steps that you need to consider and those are the five steps on that COVID-19 your poster that you need to workplace just want to touch on 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 the rid or reporting guidelines these are uh, new guidelines that have come in from from the government or, or additional uh, uh, rid or guidelines if you're not familiar with, with rid or it's the reporting of uh, infectious diseases and, and dangerous occurrence regulations um so this is is all specifically around um, the additional regulations that's been added for, for covid19 so um, if if an unintended incident at work uh, to someone's possible or, or, or actual uh, exposure to coronavirus, then then you have to report that to the HSE as a, as a dangerous occurrence. Um, so that may be um, uh, perhaps a fine to customer walking in. You're unaware that that you know they have the virus, uh, and then that could be exposing some of your staff. That that does need to be reported as a as a dangerous occurrence. Um, and I think with the track and trace system now that's going to be perhaps easy to to manage you know because i kind of looked at that and thought well how do you know if somebody walks into your workplace and they've got the virus how do you know that well hopefully with a track and trace system in place now that that might become a little bit more apparent um if one of your members of staff have been diagnosed with with covid19 and and there is reasonable evidence that you know that was caused at work then that has to be reported to um uh, I think it's Public Health England first of all, and then HSE. Um, that's got to be reported as a disease, and in, in the unfortunate uh, event of, of, of a fatality as a result of, of you know occupational exposure uh, to coronavirus, then of course that needs to be reported through RIDOR as well. Uh, much more information around RIDOR on the health and safety website. So again, I can direct you to that, and that's uh, that'll give you all the information that you need there. Um, just on the health and safety executive, um, they are or have been over the last few years stripped of millions of pounds of funding from the, the, the Treasury um, due to austerity and, 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 and cuts, nothing to do with coronavirus. But um, they, they went down from, from a, a funding of, of just shy of 90 million. It's down to 40 million now. Over the next few years, it's going to be cut even more. Um, so, so essentially, health and safety executive are, um, are sort of partially self-funded and, and will be fully self-funded over the next few years. Um, so they have to kind of sort of get back that money from somewhere. So, so in terms of funding it themselves, they've introduced something called fee for intervention. Now, this has not been introduced because of coronavirus. This has been in place for, for, for 12, 18 months now. But it's important for you to perhaps know know about fee for intervention and what that is um, so what they are doing health and safety executive is they are increasing the number of spot checks that they're going to be doing on businesses now over and above what they've normally done and they will be looking for the measures that we've just talked about they're going to be looking for these measures to be in place fee for intervention is not a fine but it's it's health and safety executive billing you for their time so 
if they come and cold call on your business and you, you allow them in, you have to allow them in, they've got the same enforcement rules as, as the police, um, they will then start to look through your health and safety policies, procedures, processes, documentation. This is why it's so important to make sure that what we've talked about this morning, you have that in place. Because they will be looking for, and specifically looking for, the fact that you are COVID-19 secure. Um, if they see a breach, then they will then start to charge fee for intervention. So this is kind of the, them billing you for their time, but they can only start to do that if they see a breach. And as you can see there, it's not cheap. It's £154 an hour. So I've heard stories of, of HSE gone into workplaces already looking for COVID-19 secure documentation and policies and charging the £154 an hour, but staying in premises for three or four hours. So three, four times £154, that's quite a lot. Um, and so it's just to make the point really that it's so important, not just for the safety of your employees, it's so important to make sure that you're protecting your business um, against the sort of visits. Um, I'm all for health and safety executive coming out and doing visits. They're there for a reason. They do a very, very good job. Um, I can't say I agree with fee for intervention. I think it's, you know, quite a hefty sort of amount to pay out. Uh, but it's there for a reason. If you want to see it as a fine, then see it as a fine. But, um, you know, it's something that, that is there. It's not going to go away. Um, £154 an hour, I think, is likely to increase year on year as well. It started off 18 months ago around £100, £110 an hour. And we're now on 154. So just to be aware of the fee for intervention is in place and health and safety executive can impose. So just to really sort of sum that up in, in a little bit is, is to remember risk assessments, so important to have the risk assessments and so important to make sure that they're ongoing. Don't kind of do one risk assessment and think that's the job done. Um, you know, you need to then diarise. Personally, I would say diarise at the moment on a monthly basis. Just monitor it and manage it on a monthly basis. Um, you know, you, you may come a time then where you might feel comfortable and confident in, you know, in doing it bi-monthly or, or, or quarterly even. But at the moment, I think a monthly risk assessment check is, is fair to, to say. Make sure, remember, to share the information with your staff. Don't just do the risk assessment and file it. Make sure everybody is aware of the, the findings of your risk assessment. The COVID-19 poster, make sure that's up. If HSE do ever come into your office, you will always make a beeline for the health and safety at work poster, but they'll also be making a beeline to make sure you've got your COVID secure poster as well. And very important to update health and safety policies to include the new legislation that the government's introduced um, down to, to COVID-19 as well. Um, a little bit about the support that, that we can provide through our partner safety to business. These are all um, the, the support mechanisms we can give you. So you've got access to health and safety advice uh, via, via professionals, um, the audits, the inspections, the checklists are done, the action plans done, health and safety policy support. If you're not sure about how to do that, we can help with that and risk assessment support. Consultancy visits are very important. That happens twice a year. Um, every six months, we'll come out and have a look at that and make sure you're doing what you're doing or make sure you're doing what you should be doing, should I say. And the health and safety software is, is a great tool because that's going to help you to manage your health and safety going forward as well, not just around COVID-19, but in general. And this is probably a great time, I think, just to, to, to re-look at your health and safety um, in your workplace at the moment. Um, contact numbers, there's, there's our, our office number, my mobile number and my email address as well. So... If I can be of any help and support, if you do have any questions that you want to take out of this webinar, then absolutely feel free to give me a call. I'm more than happy to, to try and sort of run through some advice and tailor it around your business because all businesses are different, sectors are different. Jay mentioned earlier uh, around the different sectors that you know the government have, have placed on the HSE website. I think there's eight different sectors on there and they all have around from memory, I think it's just about a 35 page dossier per, per sector for you to work through. So there's quite a lot to do. So if you need any help and assistance or just want to fire some questions at somebody, there's my contact details. Feel free to do that. Um, that's for me done. I think, Sam, if you, uh, I'll hand back to, to Sam. 
where I was just unmuting myself. Uh, thanks, Jason. Really, really insightful, really informative. Really appreciate your time this morning. Um, okay, so we do have Jay and Jason for another 10 minutes or so. So as mentioned, you do have the opportunity to ask questions. Please post them in the questions box. Um, I appreciate everyone's businesses are different. And if you do want to remain anonymous, then you can just send the question directly to me or directly to one of the speakers. But just while you while you fire your questions in, I'll kick us off. I've got a couple. Firstly, just to Jay. Sorry to come back to Jay about furloughing. Um, but I did just want to put this up at the beginning. Is it possible to bring staff back on part on a part-time basis now? No. Uh, from the 1st of July, you can do that. Um, and it's, it's, it's staged for July, August, July and August, and then September uh, and October in terms of the employer contribution. So it's going to be increasing the employer contribution and reducing the government contribution to the furlough grant, but the part-time comes in from the 1st of July. So what you need to be doing is really gearing up to think that through now. You know, think about which of your um, staff would be appropriate to bring back part-time. You also, in um, some of you, Andy particularly, uh, Frogger, I notice is on here, will know more about the mechanism of that, but I read that um, at the moment we're used to putting down on the furlough claim what hours somebody normally works. Well, I think it'll be the reverse, won't it, Andy, where it'll say what they're not working. You have to put what they're not working is you have to pay the employee their normal salary for the hours that they're working and then put on the furlough claim what they're not working. So, you know, that, that'll be a mechanism for like accountants. And I don't know much about that. But yes, in principle, it'll be a really good thing, I think, uh, to enable people to come back part time from 1st of July. Um, first question then to you, Jason. It might sound like a stupid question, but does it have to be two metres apart everywhere in your workplace? Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, if you're following the, the government guidelines of, of the two metre ruling, the social distancing, then, then absolutely. Um, there are instances, as we've covered off there, that um, it might not be possible. You know, it just might be so, so difficult to, to do. Um, I spoke to a landlord of, of, a, um, of, a, of a pub um, down south a couple, um, couple of days ago, last week sometime, and um, he, he posed a question exactly the same. He said, at the moment the pub closed, um, he said, but we um, are doing takeaways at the moment. We're doing pizza takeaways just to try and keep, a, uh, keep some money, sort of cash flow coming in. He said, I can't possibly you know, um, uh, stay away two metres. You know, we've got somebody at the pizza oven, somebody doing the dough and somebody putting the toppings and so on. And so we talked about ways around that, you know, of, of the plastic uh, uh, aspect of the screening. It's, well, how, how can I do the screening when, you know, they've got to pass the dough from one person to another. So we talked about then, well, you know, have a, have a sort of a, a, you know, a rectangular cutout in the perspex so you can pass it through. So there's always ways of, 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 of ways of around of do, doing things like that. Um, but essentially, at the moment, um, from a health and safety executive point of view, the health and safety executive are being guided, as the government are, by the, the chief medical scientists. Um, two metre rule applies in, in health and safety as well. So, yeah, absolutely. I had a question coming through now. Um, this will probably be relevant to quite a lot of people, um, chamber included. So, um, if you're in a serviced office, uh, what should you do about the elements of the office that you don't control? Somebody sent in a question saying that the company in question is not coming back to them with risk assessments and their procedures in this, I guess, the uh, the communal areas of office space. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, it's a good question. You know, we, we there are a lot of businesses in serviced offices, the Regis buildings, you know, that, that sort of kind of, um, you know, biz space, biz hub, you know. Um, you know, the, the risk assessments that we talked about today, the... Uh, health and safety implications that we've talked about today you're responsible for that for your own work in space so if you're renting a, a, an office um, in a regis building for example you know within those four walls of your office then same rules apply you know what we've talked about today the risk assessments and so on you're responsible for doing that you're absolutely right if it's say for example a regis building the management company that regis use it's their responsibility then 
for the walkways, the communal areas, and so on. But you are absolutely right as well that you know you should ask for a copy of the risk assessments that they've carried out, so you can incorporate that into your health and safety file as well. If they're not forthcoming, um, I think in the first instance, I'd probably write a strongly worded letter to them uh, as a tenant to the landlord that you know they are responsible for that and they are responsible for giving you that documentation. If that's still not forthcoming, then um, probably the, the, the right channel to go down is to speak to health and safety executive. It sounds a bit whistleblowing, but you know, you have to take these sort of steps if that's not forthcoming. So yeah, good good question. Um, but yeah, but for, for, for the office that you're renting, the space that you're renting, that's your responsibility. Communal areas is the responsibility of your, of your landlord. Thanks, Jason. Um, should employees sign any form of disclaimer if they do have to break the two metre distancing rule? Um, should they sign a disclaimer if they end up breaking it? Um, yeah, I think, I think, well, certainly from an employer's point of view, I think, I think, you know, you'd have to have that consultation as to why, why it's been broken in the first place. You know, if you put in the, the two metre social distancing steps in place, then these rules shouldn't really be broken. So perhaps it's a, a consultation as to why it has been broken. Um, if it's their own doing, if it's their own responsibility, then I think this is where there's one step or one foot lands in employment law as well and Dale correct me if I'm wrong but you know if it, if it, if it is there on, of their own doing then then really I think Jay tell me there if I'm wrong or right but that's a disciplinary matter. I, I think maybe the question what the question is getting at is how does the employee protect itself or themselves if um, if they can't control the fact that they're within two meters uh, and I think really you know the onus is on the employer to get that right. I, can't, I don't think a disclaimer is probably the right way, but uh, an employee should raise that concern with their manager. Um, and if they feel that there is no way that they can conduct their work uh, observing the two metre distance, then they've got the right to say that they don't want to work. Uh, we've already, yesterday, we uh, took a call from somebody on a whistleblowing um, for something very similar. I think we're expecting to see a lot more of that. Um, the, on the two metre rule, there is some talk about reducing that, isn't there, to one metre, possibly. Um, we're, we're not there yet, but particularly for hospitality businesses, it's going to be impossible to run businesses with the two metre rule in place. So, so just to clarify that, that then, Jay, you'd have to have a discussion with em, employees to, to sort of seek their approval if, if, they're, if they're happy to, to uh, not adhere to the two metres and work, then it's that it's accepted really, but they have also got the opportunity to say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to stay at home. Yeah, I mean, the two metre rule is only one aspect, you know, the, the, I think in Jason's slides, he covered um, where you can't observe the two metre rule, you have to look at other ways of limiting transmission. Um, so you have to think a bit creatively. And what I suggest is, depending on what sector you're in, have a look at one of the eight sector guides, because they are quite detailed. Um, and they should give you some guidance on what you can do. And if that doesn't cover it, then get in touch um, with Jason and he can see what your particular circumstances are and see if he can help you. I'm um, not sure if this is for Jason or Jay, uh, but Colin asks, um, if you're visiting customers' sites, um, should you be requesting a copy of their risk assessment ahead of time? Um, anything you should suggest considering regarding this point? You, you can do. Um, there's not just to do with COVID, but you know you can, I suppose, in any circumstances. Whether you're going to feel comfortable doing that, I, I don't know. Um, I suppose if you go to a customer site and you notice that they haven't got anything in place, like hand sanitizers and the COVID posters, then you might want to politely point it out to them. But yes, I suppose you you can ask um, for for their risk assessment. Okay. Yeah, I think just to just to add to that as well, I think if, you know part, part of my role at Biani Law is 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 actually that is is most of my days spent going out visiting businesses, 
um, remotely at the moment from, from a Zoom point of view, but um, under normal circumstances, yeah. And, and you know, I, I would want to know from a personal point of view that, you know, the, the business that I'm going to um, is, is safe and secure as it possibly can be for, for me to, um, for, you know, for me to go in there and enter it. Um, would I ask to see their risk assessment? Um, I probably wouldn't go as far as asking to see their risk assessment, but but I would certainly want to see things like, as Jay mentioned, you know, when you go into the premises, the hand sanitizers um, and things like that. I, being in the kind of industry that we're in, I, I would look for the COVID-19 posters and, and just make sure that, you know, in my own mind, that, that they, they, they have taken reasonable steps to, to make it safe for, for visitors. But um, yeah, there's certainly no rule that I've seen that, that, that you need to be asking to see the risk assessment, but certainly I think just a bit of common sense and, you know, make sure that you're safe, you know, to, to, to go in there. Um, uh, I, I was thinking about this the other day, actually, and, and, you know, I think when we do get back to some kind of whatever the new normal looks like, um, and, and I do start to go back into businesses, then I think probably a question that, that I would ask is that, you know, do we have a safe environment for us to, to have a meeting? Is there a safe environment within your workplace to, to hold that meeting, you know, and, and that would be, you know, do we have a, you know, do you have a private meeting room where, where we can sit on a one-to-one -one basis and keep that social distancing? Um, you know, would, would I want to be in a warehouse um, where people are kind of brushing past me all the time? Probably not. So I think it's just asking those questions, isn't it? But certainly I wouldn't necessarily want to see a full risk assessment. Okay, so I'm conscious of time, um, so I think we are going to bring it to a close unless anyone's got any burning questions they want to just fire through quickly. Um, and in the meantime, Jason, Jay, is there anything final that you want to add? I think um, I think Collins uh, from Affinity uh, has just put put a comment on about the temperature checks, and I, I'm not I don't think we've covered that, Jason. But you know there are some really great technological advances, uh, and it's good to see local businesses offering things like that which will give a lot of comfort to businesses that are particularly worried so uh colin i wouldn't mind trialing one of those so you know i've no idea how that would work but uh, it sounds really interesting um and then i think the only thing that i want to add from the things that we've talked about um as i said it's looking likely that we will be working from home or those people that can work from home will be working from home for quite quite a while possibly to the end of the year at least um for, for some sectors so, you know, make sure you've got your home working policies in place uh, if you haven't already, because they'll cover things like insurance, uh, security of your data, um, equipment, as well as the health and safety aspects. So, you know, make sure that you've got one in place. Uh, and communication, all I'd say at the end is communication is the key. Those employees that are going to cause trouble, and I'm talking as an employment lawyer here uh, and sound quite cynical, that I've been doing this job a long time, but those employees, are going to complain and take you to a tribunal are those who feel that ha they haven't had any ownership and they haven't been communicated with properly so you know that's a fairly simple thing to do is to engage your workforce in the measures that you're taking um and then you know that limits your risk apart from anything else uh, jay and I, I would just add to that as well i think um you know that's that's why it's so important you know to have things documented down especially if you've got less than five five staff because as jay said if, if for any reason staff are disgruntled by something and and they do end up going to tribunal the tribunal judges are going to look for documentary evidence and if you haven't got it it's very difficult for you to to kind of sort of back for you for your own side and again just on colin's point there in terms of the temperature checks we, we've covered that on, on on various other webinars that we've done as well uh, it's not a, it's not a government guideline at the moment but but i'm sure it will come in um, and I think it's very good practice to have those temperature checks done. Um, as part of your risk assessment, um, you know, how, how are you going to identify that staff coming in on a daily basis are, are, are fit to work, they don't have the, the, the virus? You know, these, these temperature screening systems that are out there are, are, are a great way to do it. Um, and yeah, I know, I, know uh, I spoke to Rich at Affinity IT, um, you know, that, that do this and, um, you know, it's a great, it's a great way of, of, of being able to check that your staff, you know, um, uh, are, are COVID clear, if you like. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you do have any um, uh, worries about that and, and you perhaps want a solution, then, then Affinity IT are probably a great company to have a chat to because they, 
they have the solutions that might might work for you in your workplace. Great, Jay, are you um, are you happy for me to share today's slides, both yours and Jason's contact details, and any links to the government guidelines? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, I'll do thanks. that as a I'll do that as a follow up to everybody on the call. Then um, I just want to say a big thank you to Jay and Jason for delivering this morning session, but uh, a special thank you really to to Jay who has worked really closely with the chamber throughout uh, the outbreak and has been most helpful uh, in delivering informative sessions to our membership. So Jay, really really appreciate it again. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so next week we've got some networking events. Um, so please enter the chamber website we've been doing some online zoom networking and they have been a real success uh, so you know, please head to the chamber website and book on some upcoming events we're uh, we're quite aware that there's a bit of death by zoom at the moment so we are just trimming down on the amount of events that we've been running um but uh, no thanks all for, for joining this morning and i'll circulate a follow-up email with the with everything on shortly uh so yeah take care everybody thanks jay thanks jason no, have a great day everyone see you later Bye.